okay so the first question consider the following statement with respect to financial payment settlement mechanisms first one instex is a mechanism developed and used by china to trade with iran to evade us sanctions second one swift is globally recognized international financial institution that manages external client accounts third one rupee real system is a trade barter system used for trade between india and iran okay so which of the above matches are correct so basically all these are in news because of uh, certain things that happened in west asia that is us withdrawing from an agreement called nuclear deal between p5 plus 1 powers and iran so because of that many countries are trying to go for different system to evade the or not to be sanctioned by us so that is why these are the different systems here basically the first and second statements are wrong the third statement is correct okay so answer is a because instex is a new system that was devised by eu that is european union this is about swift swift is nothing but a messaging uh, network where you for every transaction for every international financial transaction before doing that the bank checks with the other bank in the form of a network called enco encrypted messaging network called swift so that is why whenever you want to send money internationally they always ask for swift code so swift code is like ifsc code in india so that is a main purpose of swift and swift headquarters is belgium so it's a global network that is why if you do any transaction here then us and many countries can have and record of it and they can go for the sanctions if you are violating international law that's why they are avoiding this and building another networks okay that is about swift so now we will go with the second question consider the following statements with respect to the trade of wild animals first one operation clean art is a pan indian operation launched to crack down on illegal trade in pangolian scales second one wildlife crime control bureau is statutory multidisciplinary body under ministry of environment forest and climate change to combat organized wildlife crime and third one international trade in specimens of sites appendix 2 list species may be still authorized by the granting of an export permit or re-export certificate so this is bit like difficult question i know because you need to have in-depth knowledge about what is sites and then what are the different appendixes and what is the range of uh, protection that is offered in sites appendix levels so if you are done like the first one is kind of a trap here the first one is wrong because clean art as it is saying it is about uh, art where they use brushes and for the brushes they are actually relying on mongoose not pangolian so that is why it is wrong this is the trap so first one is wrong whereas the second one is absolutely correct it is a statutory body and it is under ministry of forest and climate change and third one is also correct because it depends on the level of protection if it would have been appendix 1 then it would have been wrong because in appendix 1 you can't export or import except for research okay in 2 there is certain permission so that is why the answer here is b so now we'll see this in detail as i said this is clean art is a recently launched operation and it is a pan indian operation uh, to crack down on this illegal use of uh, mongoose what they do is they take the mongoose fur or hair and they use it for paint brushes especially for art that is why it is called clean art and next thing it is conceived by wildlife control crime control bureau and this is very important organization guys because last time also it was in news because there was a prestigious award given to it and there was a question also that's why you need to know every detail about it and second thing mongoose mongoose is listed in schedule 2 part 2 of wildlife protection act and what does that mean that means you can't smuggle or possess the body parts of it that is an offense so it might not have the same protection as schedule 1 but it still has good protection okay and next thing uh these are the facts like they were conducted rights and all it is not that important and then the iucn status iucn status of mongoose is least concern right now but still it is being exploited so much and right now this is listed in sites appendix 3 appendix 3 significance is zero quota for commercial trade that means even if it is in appendix 3 you can't sell or do mongoose trade commercially okay 
and then in india there are basically six species that is indian gray mongoose small indian mongoose and this uh, indian gray mongoose is found everywhere but small indian mongoose is found in india and sri lanka and then you have ruddy mongoose crab eating mongoose the last three varieties are basically found in northeast and eastern part of india so these are kind of six varieties and the indian gray mongoose is the one which is most hunted and then you have a bit details about wildlife crime control bureau as i said it is a statutory body and it's headquartered in new delhi and the second thing is it uh, comes under the wildlife protection act and it has certain uh, functions like advising the custom authorities in inspection and all and also coordinating with sites because it functions with sites and other uh, even like interpol like interpol there is a separate organization for wildlife crime so it coordinates with that as well this is the one i am saying so wildlife crime control bureau one prestigious clack or bavin wildlife enforcement award and part of this you also have to know this operation save kurma so that was also important that was an operation launched by wildlife control bureau to save turtles so that is why this organization is important and then you have sites sites is a convention to regulate not to completely prohibit this is something you have to note it is not prohibiting but it is regulating the trade of wildlife fauna and flora so that is why what they do is they categorize this endangered animals in three lists okay one two three and then they accord similar kind of or respective protection to trade they don't completely stop the trade they allow the trade but with the license and that too depending on the species protection level so sites is basically headquartered in geneva this is something you have to know and next thing sites secretariat is administered by united nations environment program and it is conceived by whom by iucn iucn is an ngo body okay and then you have this appendix this is a thing at least you have to have a basic idea like not the in detail one that is appendix one is a top priority if it is if a species is listed in appendix one then you can't uh trade except it for research purpose that is for scientific research second thing appendix 2 in appendix 2 in appendix 1 one more thing if the species is endangered then you can put it in that list or most endangered one but in appendix 2 the species which might not be directly threatened or endangered but if the trade is not controlled then it might go into that level so that's why second level of protection you can see some examples also here so that is why in second level you need to have a license that is import permit is needed under the sites list appendix 2 to import any item or any animal or fauna that is there under appendix 2 list and third one is where you completely regulate the trade for commercial aspects so in this all the map turtles walruses these are the examples and in this like uh, another important unique feature of appendix 3 is that for a adding or removing any animal from the list of appendix 1 and 2 you need the permission of sites or approval of sites but for appendix 3 you don't need any national government can directly add or remove from the appendix 3 so that's how you can see appendix 1 full protection appendix 2 next level that is only for uh, not endangered one and appendix 3 is more flexible okay so that is about uh, sites and this is the news that came in hindu so there is a snippet like you can see how the hair is being used on the right side in the paint brush for, and this is being used because it lasts for longer time and it gives a fine print in the paint that is why they are more relying on this so now the focus should not only be on cracking them but should focus should also go on developing the alternatives only then this kind of trade can be reduced okay now the third one consider the following statements with respect to the major disease outbreaks in the recent past first one kesanur forest disease is caused by a parasite and monkey acts as a natural reservoir for this second one zika virus is spread by aedes aegypti mosquito the same mosquito that transmits dengue and chikungunya third one bats are said to be natural hosts of ebola virus which of the above statements are correct so kindly read these statements once again process them and then uh so here basically the kesanur forest disease a statement is where you have a kind of trap because here i am stating half of the fact as true and there you might be like uh, 
willing to take this statement as correct because i'm saying monkeys acts as natural reservoir and many many of you might have already read in news about kesanuru linked with monkeys and it is happening in karnataka it is endemic right now it is an endemic disease to karnataka forests so that's why you might seem first as correct but first is wrong because it is not caused by a parasite but instead it is caused by a virus so all these three are virus diseases so first one is wrong and second one is absolutely correct it is transmitted by the same mosquito that transmits dengue and chikungunya but this virus is deadly this is very dangerous so second is correct and even third one is also correct the bats are said to be the natural reservoirs and this transmitted to humans when they eat when they ate these bats or bush meat basically that happened in africa in the western side of africa so that's why two and three are correct here okay now we'll see the uh, diseases in detail and uh, as i said before also i have discussed some of the viruses but this is very important like uh, focusing on this because they might not focus on corona but there are many outbreaks that happened in 18 and 19 which are very very important for films so that's why you need to know what causes it what is a host what are the symptoms and whether there is a vaccine or uh, drug for this or not this much information you need to have for every disease or outbreak that happened so as i said it is basically the context is basically there was a monkey park that was planned and it was opposed by people because of the fear of this disease that's why that's why it was in news so basically it was caused by a virus family called flaviviridae and it is first in 1957 and the important thing is it is endemic to indian state of karnataka right now okay and rodents shrews and monkeys are common hosts for this virus and uh, it transmits to human from a tick bite this is also very important so what happens is basically a tick that is there in the forest usually bite those monkeys and then when they bite humans this disease gets transmitted this is the main mode of transmission and then signs you all know like the common signs like chills fevers headache and all and then diagnosis is basically by molecular detection of same pcr right now what we be having for coronavirus treatment there is no specific treatment but there is a vaccine available for this disease this is very important okay so now we'll see this through an visual information so like you can see here you can read for yourself so like either you touch animals or when these monkeys are bite by these kind of uh, ticks or insects and then when they bite humans this is transmitted or when these ticks bite cows and when you interact with the cows this disease is transmitted so this is a mode of transmission and then you have zika virus this is very very important and the unique feature of zika virus is it can be even transmitted sexually okay that is one thing and second thing when it infects a pregnant woman the children are born with very small head and large brain this is important small head but large brain so because of this brain abnormalities the child will have neurological disorders in the future so this is very important and right now there is no treatment or vaccine and the uh, symptoms will be almost common for all the virus okay don't focus on symptoms much but this is a thing and this is a uh, transmitted by a mosquito that is aedes aegypti aedes aegypti mosquito this is the one which causes dengue and chikungunya and kindly remember the mosquito that causes malaria is again different so try to see that also and see that technical name because sometimes they might confuse you with the malaria mosquito okay and then you have ebola virus so ebola is more deadly why it is more deadly than coronavirus you know because it causes internal and external bleeding and it causes a uh, kind of failure in the endothelial cells that means you can have bleeding on the, your skin so when you have bleeding then you have source of transmission will be more and body fluids also will act as one source of transmission so even sweat will be responsible for transmission of ebola virus that's why it was feared most but fortunately we were able to control it in africa itself but these were the natural hosts and this gets transmitted and the same thing like symptoms and all rest of all are same thing and another uh, dangerous feature is it takes 2 to 21 days for the incubation period that is very long to be detected that's why it was considered some one of the deadly disease kindly read the slides when you get like for more information okay now we'll go with the fourth question so consider the following statements with respect to reservation for sc st communities so kindly note here that this is an question like after the latest supreme court judgments okay 
So the first statement, the reservations in the promotion of SC, ST individuals is not applicable to people who belong to creamy layer of their community. Second one, the reservation in promotions does not require the state to collect quantifiable data on the backwardness of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Third one, the claim to reservation in promotions is not a fundamental right in India. And choose the answer carefully, okay? And then we'll disclose the answer. Okay, so if you're done here, like all the three statements are absolutely correct, but these are the statements that were, became correct after a recent Supreme Court judgment. Okay, so that is why uh, I was saying like this needs to be considered as a fact after Supreme Court judgment. Because if you basically see the Reservation Act and things, we tend to believe that reservation is kind of a fundamental right because it is included in Article 16, Article 14, and Article 15. Okay, but it is not as Supreme Court said it in the recent 2018 case. And similarly, uh, earlier it used to be a condition that quantifiable data should be shown by the government to extend reservation in promotions, but not anymore in the recent case. And the first one where I'm saying the creamy layer is earlier applicable or usually applicable, we feel that it is only for OBC, but it is applicable even for promotions case. That is also made clear by Supreme Court. So these were the three important uh, statements that came out of recent Supreme Court judgment. So part of this, so as I said, answer is one, two, and three. So now we'll see. So part of this, it is very important for us to remember important Supreme Court judgments on reservation. So they might give miss and match, or they might give directly the judgment name, because in the recent practice, if you see, number of prelims questions are coming on judgments. So that's why judgments are always important. So the first case related to reservation is Champakam Dorai Rajan case. It's very, very important in 1951. So basically in this Supreme Court said the constitution or fundamental right right now doesn't provide for reservation. So they said reservation is not possible. So whatever the law made by the parliament at that time was invalidated. So the parliament went subsequently after this judgment and amended article 15 by inserting clause 4 and saying that reservation can be done now. So that's how after Champakam Durai Rajan by an amendment, constitutional amendment, the reservation was extended. Then the famous case, Indra Sahwani case came in 1992. Why? Because before 1992, there was a Mandal Commission and that Mandal Commission recommended reservation for OBCs. So that's how this again came to the court. And in this, Supreme Court said, you can give reservation, fine, you can give it to OBCs, that is 27%. But the thing is, the whole as a reservation should not exceed 50%. This is very important. So as a whole reservation should not exceed 50%. This is even fought right now also, where many states are crossing this limit and they're going to Supreme Court and then they have another escape clause in the form of ninth schedule. So part of this, you need to know what is the ninth schedule. That was also a prelims question because they are using ninth schedule as a escape clause. And then basically after this Indra Savahane case, uh, parliament uh, enacted another constitutional amendment called 77th. So in that they said, now we will extend the reservations in promotions, not just in direct reservation, but in promotions to SCST. And then came, these people again went to Supreme Court. And then in 2016, a famous case called M. Nagaraj case came. So in that case, what the Supreme Court said is, fine, you can extend the reservation even in promotions for SC and ST, but there are three conditions that needs to satisfy. Only then you can extend. What are those three that are very important for you to remember? First thing, the government should show that SC and ST communities should be socially and educationally backward. They should be socially and educationally backward. Second thing, they are not adequately represented in public employment. Third thing, the government should also show that they this will not have any effect on the efficiency of administration so these were the three conditions laid out by Imanagaraj case and then finally in 2018 in Jarnail Singh case Supreme Court said we don't need to follow this Nagaraj case conditions so government doesn't have any requirement to collect the quantifiable data and show that they are not adequately represented so it is fine even if you don't do because reservation is not a fundamental right reservation is basically a enabler so that's why it is more freedom is there with the government so that is one second thing reservation not freedom not fundamental right and third thing as i said 
it cannot apply this to creamy layer like for joining you don't apply to creamy layer similarly in promotions also you will not apply to the creamy layer even in SCST. so this much you have to remember kindly go through this once again it is very very important not just from prelims but even from mains point of view because there was another development called EWS reservation economically weaker section reservation so kindly go through that also right now it is going on uh, in Supreme Court there's a case going on there is no judgment but see kindly what are the articles that were added or what are the provisions that were added because of EWS in the article 16 and 15 okay so that's it with respect to reservations so now we'll see fifth one consider the following statements with respect to torrefaction technology that was in news first one torrefaction is a thermal process to convert biomass into a coal like material which has better fuel characteristics than the original biomass second one this is a swedish technology now being tested for use in reducing impact of stubble burning so here again both of these statements are absolutely true and this was a news basically because there was an agreement between Swedish king who came to India on a visit and Indian government about using the Swedish technology in reducing the stubble burning. So that's why it is Swedish technology. The second statement is correct. Even the first one is also correct. So what they do is basically now uh, the biomass you all know, right? that agriculture residue whenever they harvest the fields there will be agriculture residue so right now they are putting the kerosene and burning because of that there is so much pollution of pm 2.5 and pm 10.10 .10. so to do away with that what this swedish technology do is they use this biomass and readily heat it at the 250 to 300 degrees with very less oxygen so in that process what happens is it converts into an pellets coal like pellets so that pellets can be used in thermal plants they can be used in steel plants in many other ways so that now you are getting an economic viability so because of this now many farmers can use this technology and you will also reduce the smoke because there will be very less smoke and very less pollutants so that's why it's a kind of cleaner technology okay that is one thing and part of this you also need to remember about uh, happy cedar so happy cedar is an another solution for stubble burning so that was already in use where happy cedar is a machine that is used to cut the entire stubble right from the bottom so that way there is no need to burn them but still those are not being available to farmers at the rate they are expecting so that's why we are going for alternatives so this is a kind of context and whatever we have discussed the same thing like uh, india is testing this swedish technology and important thing here is torrefaction is will convert the rice stubble into bio coal bio coal is a word that you need to remember this will explain in the further down in the slide but this converts into bio coal and this is a kind of solution and torrefaction process i've explained like in very low oxygen atmosphere at a degrees of 250 and 350 this will convert into a different biomass and basically this changes the elements of biomass into coal like pellets and these pellets can be used for combustion along with coal for industrial applications like steel and cement and power generation and if it's scaled up 65 percent of the biomass can be converted into energy so this is a significant development so now what is bio coal so bio coal is nothing but it is a synthetic coal that is created by the torrefaction of biomass this process this process is called torrefaction where you heat the biomass the raw biomass at 250 to 360 very low oxygen then it converts into a different biomass called bio coal and this bio coal has similar characteristics to traditional coal but the only thing is it will reduce the greenhouse gas emissions so bio coal basically doesn't mean it is natural but it is instead it is uh, artificial one okay and this is the process that how they do so like untreated biomass will be there and then they do dry and then it will be fed to combustion and then torrefaction will happen and then directly again you will compact it compress it and then the final product torrefication biomass on the right side you can see okay okay so now having done that we'll go for the sixth question so gafa tax there is nothing but google apple facebook and amazon tax that was constantly in use is imposed by which of the following country a usa b germany c eu and d france so this was constantly in use and uh, it is very easy question so i guess you would have already uh, known the answer and marked it so we'll disclose this so it's basically the answer is here is france 
So France is a country that imposed this GAFA tax, which is also called digital tax. And it was the first time the France imposed it on Google and all these countries. And it became a huge controversy because the US in return said we will impose more customs duty on imports from France like wine and other products. So because of that, it's kind of went into a trade war thing. So that's why it was very much in news. That is one aspect. Second thing, right now you all know there is uh, no more only physical goods and services where you can tax but the digital domain is growing and in digital domain you don't need to have the company in the country where it is servicing for example uh, an internet company like byte dance might still operate from china without any presence in india by launching different applications so how will you tax them you'll not be able to tax them. So that is a problem. That's why these countries are going for a new form of tax called digital tax. So that is this. So basically this GAFA is one example of that digital tax. So it is an informal name given to tax collected on income generated through digital services like online shopping through Amazon, online ads in Google, etc. And this France applied it's about 3% on revenues from targeted advertising transmission of data collected about users for advertising purposes like because Google and Facebook what they do because they collect your data and then based on that they will give you personalized ads so that is why government has full right to tax on them part of that only this France came and now what is equalization levy because this is a kind of Indian GAFA so Indian kind of digital tax and India brought this in uh, 2016 I believe Okay, so this equalization levy is a direct tax which is withheld at the time of payment by the service recipient. The two conditions to be met. So first I'll explain this. What do we mean by service recipient? For example, Indian an Indian uh, customer is actually asking Google to give his ad. Then if he is paying like about 1 lakh, that is of 2 lakhs, suppose example 2 lakhs is paying. Then at the time of payment itself, they will impose a tax called equalization levy of 6% of that. So that means he will pay around 2 lakhs 12,000 to the Google and that 12,000 Google will deposit in as a tax to India. So that is the thing. And for this, there are two conditions. One payment should be made to non-resident service provider. That means the service provider should not be in India. So that is the first condition. Second condition, the payment should be above 1 lakh in one financial year. And this was also a kind of friction point between India and US right now, but still it is there. So it is 6%. And for this uh, equalization levy, there is a technical term called significant economic presence. So they brought in in the act. So this is very important. So what is the significant economic presence? We'll see here. So basically significant economic presence is introduced for the purpose of corporate income tax, which should satisfy the three conditions. That is first thing, advertisement that targets a customer residing in India or who accesses that advertisement should be through the internet protocol. That means that should be through an IP address which is in India. If the advertisement is targeting an IP address in India, then he can say that significant economic presence. Second condition, the sale of data collected from a person in India, in India from India. That means if there is any data collection from a person who is residing in India or there is a sale of goods or services using data that is collected in India and the advertisement. If these three conditions, any of these are satisfied, then you say that company is having significant economic presence. So if a company is having significant economic presence and if somebody is paying above one lakh and if it's not that company is not in India, then you can impose equalization levy. So this is very important to know the conditions from Blem's point of view. So that is it with this topic. Then we'll go for the next one. Bharat bond exchange traded fund should be the first would be the corporate would be the sorry Bharat bond exchange traded fund would be the first corporate bond exchange traded fund in the country second one the exchange traded fund differs from mutual funds primarily in the aspect that while mutual funds selling buying can be transacted directly, the ETF is basically traded on secondary market just like shares. And third one, ETF have more liquidity and marketability than mutual funds. So kindly read once again the statements and then mark your answer. We'll see the right solution. 
so this was meanwhile this was in news because this was the first time as the first statement said this is the first time india has launched such a fund so here basically i have kept all the three statements correct so that you will be able to remember it well so here the answer is b okay so now we'll see this in detail so as i said the cabinet committee on economic affairs approved it so first we'll see what is exchange traded first and then how it is different from mutual fund and then we'll see the features of this bharat bond so the first thing is exchange traded fund is basically is a kind of pooling together assets so what they do is for example there are four companies you pull shares from all these companies and put it in common for common uh, category called exchange traded fund and then you will divide them into certain units for example you have pulled 10% shares from bpcl 10% from ioc 10% from another shell company okay and then this 30% shares value what are the values there you will divide them by certain factor and then you will make certain units and then these units will be traded but these units will be traded like an ordinary shares in the secondary markets that is the important thing so this is a exchange traded fund so what is the benefit this way the government will get good revenue and people will can directly buy those funds because if you want to buy buy shares of certain government companies you have to invest more amount of money but if, if you want to buy certain units it will be of only less price like 1000 rupees or 1500 so more people can directly engage in these kind of bonds where government exchange traded funds are usually secure so that is the advantage now we'll see how it is different from mutual fund because mutual funds also does the same thing they also pool the shares and create a mutual fund and that will be managed by a fund manager and then they will sell it to the users but they differ in certain way so what is that first of all they are similar in the aspect as i said that they pool the assets but they differ with respect to tradeability on stock exchange because if you know that mutual funds are not traded on the like shares in the secondary market whereas this etf can be traded just like shares in the secondary market that means there will be more liquidity you can buy and share them at any time whereas mutual funds are not like that there will be an final price at the end of the day for the mutual fund but there is no it uh, like a complete close of the day price for etf it completely varies so that's why it is more dynamic and more liquid so etfs are better alternatives than mutual fund so this is the main difference and this is a hindu paper cutting like when this was launched on uh, december 4th or 5th so etf to comprise basket of bonds issued by central public sector enterprises other government entities and you can see the futures like it is triple a rated bonds so it is more secure and the price will be 1000 per unit and uh, the maturity date is usually 3 years and 10 years so that and the benefits is like central public sectors will get a good source of borrowing and it will also enhance participation of people in the stock markets so these kind of benefits are there and now we will see the eighth question consider the following statements with respect to the protection of plant varieties and farmers rights act pfra act was enacted to conform to conventions trips that is system and international union for the protection of new varieties of plants to which india was signatory second one under this act farmer shall not be entitled to sell branded seed of variety protected under ppv and fr act 2001 and third one a farmer can save use so reso exchange share or sell his farm produce including seed of variety protected under ppv and fr act 2001 so kindly read these statements once again uh, here uh, you might think like the second statement and third statement are appearing contradictory but it is not true so kindly read one second and mark your answer and then we will discuss them in detail fine so if you are done so like previous question here also as this was an important act i have made all the three provisions true so the all the three statements are correct here so the answer is c that is 1 2 and 3 and now we'll see what it is act why it is in news and what we need to know about
that was one in 2018 and one is 2019 so in 18 what happened is the famous episode of pepsico so what they did is pepsico is a company and that uh, manufactures this lace okay and when they manufactured this lace they use certain kind of potatoes a certain breed of potatoes which are patented under this act and they gave the permission to uh, or get into a kind of contract with the farmers to sow and sell it to them only in gujarat what happened some other farmers also have sowed this seeds illegally and have sold it to other companies so this company filed a lawsuit against them in court that's how this became a huge controversy how come a company like pepsico can file a suit against farmers who doesn't even know whether they are sowing legal one or illegal one they don't know certain awareness and all so that's why it was so much in controversy that is first thing second thing why it was a news is there was a new bill called seeds production bill or seeds right bill where they were trying to uh, do certain amendments to this act that's why it is important so if you see the first statement is correct here that is two conventions we have signed that is we have to protect the intellectual property rights and also we are protecting protection of new varieties at the same time we want protection of farmers also so this bill tries to balance everything part of that it gives certain rights so if you see it gives the farmers rights to save use exchange or sell in the same manner before this act came so basically what the meaning is farmer can do sell so anything they can do but they can't put it in a package brand them and then sell them which are patented by other companies under this act that is the only limitation that means they can even so the patented varieties of pepsico but only thing they should not brand it okay that is the implication of this third statement sorry second one i said farmer shall not be entitled to sell branded seed the branded seed here is a word so they can sell it but they cannot do it in packaging and branding so that is the first second thing right to register varieties so here farmer can register any uh, variety that he is growing if it subjected to uniqueness uniformity and stability and third thing government will not even charge for filing that intellectual property right you have protection of plant varieties and for how this act is been implemented certain measures also and then you have right to information and compensation for crop failure for example if pepsico gives seeds to farmers and farmers are facing loss because of the failure of the crop then they can claim compensation from that patented company and fourth one last one curb on undisclosed use of traditional varieties so this prevents like any company to utilize unpatented one but being traditionally used and then there are three other rights like the breeders breeders are nothing but companies here so they are the ones who formulate new varieties like for chips the potato should have less kind of moisture and less sweetness so that is why they brought in new variety of uh, this lace potato so that is a one manufactured by or bred by pepsico and they have patented it so breeders have the exclusive rights to produce sell market distribute import and export protected variety and researchers can also use like any one which is patented and third one farmers i said farmers can still so even the one that is patented by breeders but only restriction is they can't brand it and sell it so that is about in detail about protection of plant varieties and farmers rights act guys this is also very important there might be either a question on prelims and if not if it misses in prelims definitely there might be a question somewhere related to this in mains okay so kindly remember that and then we have the final topic that is the ninth topic so i don't have a question for this so we have just the information so we'll discuss this and then we'll close it for day so this is emissions gap report is an uh, report that is released by united nations environment program and it's an annual flagship program so what they do basically is, uh, in emissions gap is the name say the emissions gap is basically the gap between what we need to do and what we are actually doing with respect to climate change so that gap they will try to highlight every year so how they do it basically they do it by seeing the emissions reduction target and the current actions like for example india is taking uh, intentional national determined contributions for uh, targets so those targets they will compare it with how much degree temperature we need to achieve that way they will publish the gap 
so this is the thing and uh, the emissions gap report basically projects three key trend lines of 2019 that is the amount of green gas emissions every year up to 2030 and the second one the commitment countries are making to reduce their emissions and impact of those commitments third thing the pace at which emissions must be reduced to reach an emission low that will limit the temperature to 1.5 degree one more thing guys you have to remember the paris deal is aiming to reduce the temperature to 2 degrees celsius and if possible to 1.5 it is not the opposite we are not aiming for 1.5 we are aiming to limit it to 2 degrees if possible to 1. Point. This is something we have to remember and the report also identifies key opportunities what countries can do and uh, the important trends that are identified by this report in 2019 is first thing g20 nations collectively account for about 78 percent of all the emissions that is the first thing second one the four emitters that are china usa eu and then india so india is at the fourth place remember first china second usa third eu as a block or if you consider it as a country and then you have india contribute about 55 percent of this total emissions in the last decade so india is at the fourth level remember this and then we must half our emissions by 2030 then if we if we have that only half by 2030 then it will take about 75 percent cut every year from 2020 to limit it to 1.5 degree so that is about emissions gap report similarly in december first week there was another report that was released that is climate risk index okay and this report is basically released by not any international organization but it is released by an organization called german watch so it is a private ngo german watch remember that released climate risk index so kindly know about that report also and there is climate vulnerability index try to know more information about that so these are the kind of three four reports that are related to climate change and they are very very important and you need to know what is india's position in some of them like climate vulnerability india is in the worst stage but with respect to emissions gap and other reports it is in good stage so try to know organizations impact and india's ranking in all these climate related indexes